Hello and welcome to WEF on the Web, our weekly uh, YouTube service from Waverton Evangelical Fellowship. My name's Robin and I'm the pastor here and it's great that you've been able to join us again in uh, another lockdown worship session. Uh, we've got our usual mix of uh, singing and talks and, but we've got something new this week. We've got some joy in the service. Not, not that we haven't got joy in the service every week, but uh, Kate has asked people to send her uh, just things that's made them joyful, things that's made them thankful throughout the week. And so we've got a, a little compilation uh, of, of stuff that lots of people have sent in. Uh, so I hope that's gonna encourage you. If you've got any questions, if you'd like to contact us for whatever reason, then you can do through the website. The website address is coming up at the bottom there, and you can go on there and drop us a line. But for now, let's begin our service with a song. God showed his love for us. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God shows his love for us. And that's a universal us. It's all of us. Well, God has no favourites. He loves all of us the same. Even when we run away from him, he chases after us. He follows us. He stays with us. He promises to look after us. But we have favourites. We have favourites for all sorts of things. Bags of crisps. My favourite flavour. 
What's the sauce? There's any left. Oh, there is. Great. Well, favourites for all sorts of things. I don't know about you. What are your favourite things? I was on a website which promises if I answer these questions, it'll tell me which is my favourite animal. Because I'm not really sure what my favourite animal is. I love so many of them. So I thought I'd have a go at this. Now, I've done lots of these questions already because there are 30 questions and some of them are quite bizarre. Um, I'll just go through it and we'll find out at the end which is my favourite animal. Would you ever raise chickens? It says. I've got four answers. I have a couple of chickens. No, I don't eat eggs. That's not true. I, I do eat eggs. I'm terrified of chickens. No, not really. I would love to have chickens someday. I'll go for that. Next question. Would you consider yourself obedient? Hmm. I'm a good boy. Mm, not always. Um, no way. I am sometimes. No, not that one. Uh, I have my moments. I'm a good team player, but I'm not obedient. I have my moments. Definitely. I'm sure some of you have noticed. Next question. Could you win? I don't know why this question's in here. Could you win a running race with your boss? <laughs> I didn't write this. I didn't write the answers either. Four possibles. I would come close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My boss would win. Not sure. I would come in first place. That's a bit confident, that, isn't it? But I don't know. Let's see. The fourth possible. My boss moves like a turtle. I didn't write that one. Uh, I would come close. Safest bet. OK. And we've got my last, my last question. Which term of endearment do you prefer? Now, this has got nothing to do with animals. Sweetie, honey, baby, darling. Be careful here. I sometimes use the word darling. Yeah, I sometimes do. Well, waiting for it, loading. You've got horse. Apparently, my favourite animal is a horse because potentially, it says here, um, you find them majestic. They're gentle giants. And you've always been impressed by their intelligence, speed and strength. Definitely. Uh, you love horses because potentially you may have been a cowboy or a jockey when you were younger. <laughs> no, I wasn't. And Sheep. Jesus often spent time with people the religious leaders didn't like. People who had done lots of things that were wrong. Those religious leaders those Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus why he spent time with these people. So Jesus, as he often did, told them a story, a parable that went something like this. Once there was a shepherd who worked hard, very hard. sheep in his flock and he cared for each one of them. He led them to green pastures, he took them to still waters. And he protected them from fierce animals that might eat them. Friends all said, he has a hundred sheep. Good for him. One day, one of his sheep wandered away. Perhaps it skipped away from the flock. Perhaps it tripped away from the flock. However it happened, one day, 
one of the sheep was lost. Friends said, he has 99 sheep left. That's plenty. But that's not how the shepherd felt. He left those 99 sheep in open country like these and went to look for the one that was lost. He looked right, he looked high and he looked low. He looked all the way around. He looked, and he looked, and he looked, until finally he found his lost sheep. He put it on his shoulders and he took it home. He said to his neighbours and friends, Come, celebrate with me. I have found my lost sheep. And his neighbours and his friends said, He has 100 sheep again. Good for him. said, why do I spend my time talking to these people who do wrong things? Because there is so much celebrating in heaven when that one person turns around to follow me. Today, boys and girls, shows a picture of Jesus carrying the lamb. Now, we're not going to paint this, we're going to do our own version of it. Start with a piece of card, a piece of white paper, that sort of size, about the size of your hand. And what I want you to do is, with a pencil or a pen, start drawing the outline of Jesus. So we've got his eyes with the pupils at the top, because he's looking up at his lamb. Remember, we are the lamb. Got his uh, tea towel. <laughs> I forget the actual name. Someone now will be shouting at the screen. Um, you can have a beard on Jesus if you want, like this one has got, or you might decide he's had a shave today. Okay, once you've drawn the outline, then you can actually um, go over with a, a marker pen or a, a, a biro, um, so you can, I, a bit more clear you can see what's going on so I'm only going to be showing you bits of this because I haven't got all the time I need to go through every little thing but you get the idea and once you have there's his two hands once you've outlined that um, the next thing to do is use some color uh, you can use color for his tunic Okay, so you can call that in, etc., etc., um, and uh, you can obviously um, his skin tone probably would not be white like this. 
not many people's skin is as white as this. So uh, colour it in, the skin tone you think, if you've got some coloured pencils are good for that. Okay, and then with a black marker you want to maybe do his hair or his beard, you get the idea. So once you've got that stage, um, your next stage is you need to, um, we're going to do the uh, our sheep. Okay, now the way you do that is cut out your, with some scissors. Now, boys and girls, ask an adult to help you with scissors because you've got to be careful and be safe. Be cutting your outline of Jesus into a sort of a, a top of a skateboard, like that. Okay, leaving some space to stick on your sheep. Next thing you need to do is stick on your sheep. Now, use um, scrunched up toilet paper if you can find some. Um, kitchen roll, or what I've got here is some cotton wool pads, cotton wool balls. Okay, so stick those on. On the back, stick on some um, pipe cleaners, or you could colour in some um, uh, some bamboo skewer bits or whatever, some twigs for his uh, for his lamb's legs. Okay, next last thing to do is to make a little stand, and to, to make a little stand, just get a little bit of card like that, fold it in half, and then it'll, like a V, it'll stand up, and then with the glue stick, stick it together there. So, there you have it. Jesus the Good Shepherd, carrying the lamb. Brilliant, well done. It's all, and he has no favourites. Let's sing the Big Family of God song together.
Lord, thank you that all of us, there's no exception, we're all part of your family. Lord, what a fantastic reason to celebrate. What a fantastic feeling to know and reality of being in your family, that you love us all. Lord, we're so different. We're so unique. None of us are the same. And yet somehow you love us all equally. Lord, thank you for your love today. Amen. Well, boys and girls, what an amazing story. and What a great song too. My question for you is this. Which animal in the Bible is mentioned 400 times? Which animal in the Bible? Do you know? It's not apparently my favourite horse. No, it's not a horse. Any, anyone have a guess? Can't hear you. It's in fact one of these, a sheep. Sheep are mentioned in the Bible 400 times. They were very common. They were everywhere. There must have been probably more sheep than people. Well, certainly there is in some countries of the world. Well, the thing about sheep is, cover your ears, cover their ears a minute. They're not very smart. In fact, they're pretty foolish. They get lost. They don't know their own way home. Even if it's right in front of them, they go their own way at times. They follow one another and get into real problems. They get stuck in hedges, stuck down ditches, stuck in fences. They are hopelessly lost without the shepherd. The shepherd needs them to look after them because without the shepherd, they don't get fed. They don't get looked after. And God says, we are helpless without our shepherd, which is God. On our own, we're, we're actually lost. And these words in Isaiah remind us that. God tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms, like I am this morning. He gathers the lambs in his arms. And we get lost sometimes, don't we? We can struggle on our own. We can get stuck. We can get uh, into difficulties when we are trying to do things on our own. But when we trust God, when we listen to him, when we talk to him, he shows us the way ahead. He's the best shepherd of all. And like in the story today, the good shepherd will always, Jesus will always come running after, after us, will always come and find us when we get lost and stuck and confused and in a bad place. And that's the amazing thing in the story of the good shepherd, how he always comes running for us, looking for us, and we're never lost from him. And he does not have favourites. He does not have favourites. What an amazing promise, and what amazing truth to remember today. Thank you for watching Sunday Club. See you soon. Hey everyone, my name's Kate and I'm part of the church family here at WEF. And I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone who replied with their things that bring them joy. So I've had some lovely photos and some interesting words and some fabulous emails to read. And I hope I've done them justice in putting pictures and words together. But it was all sparked off by a section from Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read it to you now. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And I love that section because it starts with a command to rejoice in the Lord and also an instruction, don't worry, but helpfully, because I always find it annoying when people say, don't worry, really hard, easy to say, hard to do. But this passage replaces that worry with something to think about things that are lovely and pure and praiseworthy. So I hope you enjoy this little section of video. Um, lasts just over a minute. And because so many of you mentioned birdsong, I've given it a dawn chorus track. 
over the top of it. So the good thing about this dawn chorus is if you find the dawn chorus annoying, you can press mute. So I hope you enjoy and thank you again for sharing your joy with me. In our prayers today, we will include, in particular, prayers for parts of the persecuted church. Those Christians who are persecuted are finding themselves in difficulties over food distribution in some cases. There are reports in India of Christians being refused food unless they converted to become Hindus. And there are reports in North Nigeria of Christians only getting one sixth of the food that Muslims get. In addition, I'd like to remember Leah Sharubu. Leah Sharubu was kidnapped by Boko Haram just over two years ago. She's still being held in captivity by Boko Haram and it's her 17th birthday on Friday. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we bow before you to bring you praise for your great creation, for the mighty power that made the universe and the vastness and wonder of all the things that you've made. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And we thank you, Lord, for your great love. We thank you that Jesus came as a man to live amongst us and to suffer and be crucified for our sin. Thank you, Lord, for that great love. We're sorry for our sins. Please forgive us for everything we've done wrong and please create in us clean hearts and renew right spirits within us. Lord, we do pray for all those suffering from the spread of the virus. We think of those bereaved and we pray that you may comfort them. We think of those who are ill and we pray that you may be with them. And we ask and pray that the government may be given wisdom to make the right decisions. And we pray that in your mercy, you might stop this virus from spreading. We pray especially for the effect that the spreading virus is having on your people in parts of the world where Christians are persecuted. 
Father, we do pray that you may especially help those who are short of food because it's been denied to them. And just ask and pray that food and encouragement may be brought to your people. And we do pray for Leah Sharabu. We thank you for Leah's courage, Lord. And we just ask and pray that you may be with her on her birthday on Friday. And we ask and pray that she may be released very soon. Lord, we pray for ourselves as a church. Please help us to grow in grace and to be the church you want us to be. Increase our love for each other and help us to walk in your way, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
2. Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went into response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel I preached among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus who was with me was compelled to be circumcised even though he was Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favouritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognise that I have been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who had been at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, who was also at work in me, an apostle to the Gentiles, James, Cephas and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognised the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I have been eager to do all along. When Cephas came to Antioch, I oppressed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate him from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that their hypocrisy, even Barnabas, was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you can force Gentiles to follow Jewish custom? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law but by the faith in Jesus Christ so we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law no one will be justified but if, in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves oh, almost among the sinners, does that, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not! If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loves me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could, not, could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. We're in the second of five parts in our mini-series in the book of Galatians. And in chapter 2, we're going to pick up from last week where Paul is addressing uh, what's going on in the churches there in that region. And in chapter 2, he addresses specifically the things that Peter is doing. Peter is there in the church uh, and the things that he's doing to not challenge 
the false teaching that's coming in and as a result we can see how it's beginning to spread uh, and Paul wastes no time in, in going head to head with him and uh, addressing the issue so we're going to look at that and then we're going to look at three things that's happening within the churches there that are not in step with the gospel so they're putting them out of step they're putting them the, the believers there out of sync with the gospel so let's have a look first of all uh, about Peter he wants to fit in he's uh, starts off we see that he's eating and fellowshipping in other words he's doing the the things of church he's he's associating with them he's sitting down to have meals with them uh, the inference is that he's worshipping with them praying with them um, and he's doing all the things that you would expect him uh, as one of the church leaders there to do with these Gentiles these were converts to Christianity who weren't previously Jews but then the the Judaizers we came across these guys last week uh, if you want a bit more background about them uh, have a look in Acts chapter 15 that that gives us a, a bit more information about them uh, but these were the people who said that you've got to obey even even when you uh, give your life to Jesus even when you accept him as Savior and Lord and put your faith in him uh, and believe in him there's still certain Jewish laws that you've got to obey if you want to get this ticket to heaven if you want to be saved and one of them uh, was circumcision circumcision is the Old Testament covenant sign of God's people now they were saying that this still applies you've got to do this and when they arrived and started saying this well Peter began to to separate himself from the Gentiles now a, a, a little bit of history there as a Jew you would not have associated with a, a non-Jew with a, a Gentile you wouldn't have invited them into your home you wouldn't have eaten with them uh, you certainly wouldn't uh, do the things that that Peter was doing with him in in terms of of Christian fellowship and, and worship uh, and it seems that he went back to that state uh, he went back to his previous Jewish roots you see he was afraid of what these Judaizers would think uh, Paul tells us that in his letter we're not sure why whether the, they were particularly whether they were violent whether there was a lot of them uh, whether they they could exert some sort of social pressure on on him we, we weren't told uh, it's not explained what the the cause of his fear is just that he's afraid uh, of these people but by identifying with them by doing what they want him to do in other words by by not associating with these non-jewish believers peter was in fact promoting their false their legalistic beliefs what he should have done was stand up to them what he should have done was to say to them look this is just not compatible with the gospel that we've heard with the good news of jesus that we've been told but but he didn't and what i want us to look at today is three things where Peter is, is out of sync or out of step with, with the gospel by endorsing these false beliefs. You see, you don't get, you don't get the benefits of the, of the gospel, this good news of Jesus, by doing a bit of a moral cleanup on your life. You get forgiveness and joy and peace and power. How? Through daily reliance upon Jesus Christ, who loved us, who loves us and who gives himself for us that's faith and faith when it's genuine creates this this rhythm of life that's in step with the truth of the gospel now, whenever we talk about the the gospel just to make it clear we're talking about this good news that Jesus died to take the punishment that we should have taken for everything that we've done which separates us from God the Bible calls that sin and the good news is that Jesus through his death and resurrection takes that punishment on him so that we can have the relationship with God in the way that it always was intended to be 
So all of these three things that puts the church in Galatia, the churches in Galatia, uh, out of step with the gospel. Well, the first one is fear. Uh, and it, it's the fear of man. It's Peter being afraid of these Judaizers, the, 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 uh, the circumcision party, as they're called. But here's the thing, the gospel, the gospel doesn't promote fear. The gospel gives us confidence and hope and boldness. Paul's writing to, to Timothy, his young apprentice, and in 2 Timothy 1.7, he said, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And if we're frightened, if we're fearful of what people think about us, in terms of our Christian beliefs, then we need to go back to the gospel. We need to see that we have, uh, we need to understand that we have no need to be fearful. Paul underlines that in, in Romans chapter eight, where he says, what, what could we say if God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all, will he not also give us all things with him? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? That's us. It's God who justifies, who is to condemn. What he's saying is, it, it's, we shouldn't be frightened of anything that anyone can do or say about us, because ultimately it's God who has the last word. And if we've put our trust and our faith in Jesus, then the last word is that we are followers of him and we stand in his image. Second thing that puts them out of sync, out of uh, uh, step with the gospel is this hypocrisy. Peter was believing one thing. He was believing in the gospel and he was doing something totally different. The word hypocrisy, uh, it, it comes from a, a, a word which means uh, to be under a false part. It was used to describe actors who, who were pretending to be somebody else. And so they played their part under a mask. That's where we get the word from, under a mask or under a part. So, so Peter was, was not being himself. He was acting out something different to the gospel that, that he'd heard and responded to. But why is he doing it? He's doing it out of fear and out of insecurity. He's frightened of what these Judaizers uh, can do to him or, or, or say about him. And, and when you feel insecure, when you feel frightened, you, you, it's natural. We're tempted to put up a front and avoid taking a stand for, for what we believe is right. See, the battle that we're fighting is a battle to believe the gospel, a gospel that tells us uh, the death of Christ assures us of God's love. It's guaranteed. Nothing, absolutely nothing, Paul says when he writes, uh, nothing can separate us from God's love. Not even death can separate us from God's love. And, and so we need to grasp that. And we need to believe that. And we need to not put on a front uh, like Peter, regardless uh, of the, the opposition that we're faced with uh, and then finally this whole thing about legalism and that's what sparked it off in the the first place these judaizers coming in and saying that the christians had to obey certain uh, laws but it's out of step with the gospel you see paul says to to, to peter if you uh, though a jew live like a gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? What did he, he mean? Well, well, Paul had, had stopped obeying, stopped keeping to, to the laws of, of Moses as set out in the Old Testament, or 613 of them. Why? Because Jesus, through his death and resurrection, had fulfilled all those laws. He was the only one uh, ever who could keep all the law of the Old Testament completely. And so there was no need now uh, for Peter to go back and start trying to keep some of the laws 
that we find in the Old Testament. So Paul's saying to Peter, if through the gospel you don't have to do this anymore, then how can you start to compel people who weren't even Jews in the first place to keep the Old Testament, the, the Jewish laws? And we see it sometimes in the church today that they're requiring that a person do, does something particular to be accepted by God and to be accepted by the church. Oh, you've got to dress a certain way. You've got to behave a certain way. You've got to get your life sorted out first. Uh, and then maybe you can come to church. Uh, and then maybe you'll, you'll believe in, in God. Well, it doesn't work that way. See, Jesus says it doesn't matter what state your life is in, that if you if you give it to him, if you put your trust in him, then once once your belief is genuine and sincere, then your life and your behavior will change as a result of that. It's it's not the other way around. It's not go and sort yourself out, go and go and fix your lifestyle, go and, and make yourself good enough, and then once you're good enough you can become a christian it's not that at all it, it, it's the other way around that jesus accepts us as we are but he doesn't leave us that way we finish off chapter two by looking at the truth and the truth is this, that we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law, not by a certain set of regulations and rules, not by, by doing things or not doing things. We, we're going to look at, in chapter five at, at some of the, 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 um, the results that being a Christian, the results that putting your trust and faith in, in Jesus has on your lifestyle. Uh, but but that's a that's a result. That's not the it, it's not the other way around. Because in chapter five we're going to be looking at the fruit of a Christian life. But the person is made right with God, Paul says, by faith in Jesus. And then he uses this phrase, and, and uh, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I live, but Christ who lives in me. If we look through the Bible, this, this idea of Christ in me and me in Christ happens over a hundred times throughout the New Testament. What does it mean? Well, it means that once we put our trust, once we put our faith in Jesus, the old self, the old self who who was out of relationship with God doesn't exist anymore. I have a new self. This is where this you might have heard this phrase to be born again, and that's that's what it means. That that spiritually I'm a new person. I've been recreated or reborn through putting my trust and my faith in Jesus because of what he did not of anything that I can do and again like every week I, I, I'm, I'm going to throw out this this challenge and, and for those of us who who've made this commitment who made this uh, declaration of faith uh, years and years ago for some of us then maybe we just need to pause and recommit ourselves and say God I thank you and I know that I'm made right with God because of my faith in Jesus but maybe you've never done that before maybe you've thought about it maybe you've heard about it uh, and maybe you've done nothing about it uh, um, perhaps you want to this morning uh, and if that's you then the way to start is to just pray uh, and that might seem like a weird thing to do but to say to God look I'm sorry for the things that I've done that have put a barrier between you and me I, I, I realize and I thank you 
that Jesus died to take the punishment that should have been mine. I want to put my faith in him. I want to put my trust in him. I want to give my life to him uh, and follow him as best I can. And if you pray that or something like that for the first time this morning, then that's brilliant. Uh, and if you'd like to, then please feel free to get in touch with us. You, you can drop us a line through our website. Uh, and we'd love if you've made that, prayed that prayer for the first time this morning. We'd love to be able to give you a call uh, and talk to you about it and help you to grow uh, and develop uh, your faith in Jesus as you begin this faith journey with him. Let's take up the truth of the gospel and let's embed it in our hearts. And let's say with Paul, it's no longer I live, but Christ who lives in me.